It's 34 degrees. Did you know that Luke's account of the transfiguration of Christ finds Moses and Elijah discussing with Christ what manner of death he would die? Luke 9, 31. Death has always been a fascinating and mysterious subject to a lot of people. From the time early in the book of Genesis that God said, In the day thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die, sin entered the world and death by sin, Paul chronicles in Romans 5.12. From that moment on, death has been a challenging subject, and believe it or not, it is one of the most oft-discussed subjects in the Bible from cover to cover. I still believe the saddest verse in the end of Deuteronomy and the beginning of Joshua is the one that says, Moses, my servant, is dead. Two weeks ago, this congregation was shocked with the sudden passing of Brother Ron Irvin. I spoke with him late on Sunday night, and little did I believe that I'd be preaching his funeral Wednesday afternoon. He was a dear friend to many of us, and his passing was sudden. And though he had had much pain and sorrow, no one expected that he would be gone that quickly. Some years ago in Lubbock, Texas, an unusual sporting event took place that occupied the front page of their newspaper. A professional wrestler named Iron Mike DiBiase died of a heart attack while he was wrestling in the ring the night before. And the caption was, Iron Mike died where he lived. And that's where we're all going to die, where we live. I ask sincerely, if you had died last night, where would that leave you today, spiritually, eternally? What if I had died last night? What would that mean for all eternity? The Bible clearly enunciates it is appointed a man once to die after this come a judgment, Hebrews 9, 27. And 2 Samuel 14, 14, in the most vivid language I've ever read, says we must all needs die. And ours water spilt upon the ground that can never be gathered again. 1 Samuel 20 verse 3 says there's but a step between me and death. And Psalm 90 verse 9 says our life is but a tale that is told. Wicked Balaam exclaimed, let me die the death of the righteous, Numbers 23, 10, but that's impossible for an unrighteous man. Only those who die in the Lord are blessed, are happy, reads Revelation 14, 13. And to sinners, Jesus said, you shall die in your sins, and where I go, you cannot come. John 8, 21. Of the one who would betray him, Jesus said, better for that man had he never been born. Mark 14, 21. And in 2 Chronicles 21, 20, we read of an evil man who died, and the Bible said, and nobody cared. To no one's regret. And so, as we solemnly and honestly and biblically face the fact that we may die today, and we could have died last night, we ought to be very sober when we discuss the subject of our very own funeral. My mother has written out uh, at age 84 what she wants done and said at her funeral. I've known other people who orchestrated, if you please, outlined what was to be done to the very last point in the funeral service and in a burial occasion. What would the Lord say at your very own funeral if he were the preacher? What would he say at my demise if there were a funeral service? In all honesty, he, without any guile in his mouth, would tell the truth. And if he spoke at all about the person in that casket being you or me, what would he say? You see, from everlasting to everlasting, he is God. Psalm 90, verses 1 and 2. And later in that same 90th Psalm, the psalmist said, So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. Would it be in the day of judgment that the Lord would say in the language of Nehemiah 2.20, You have nothing precious to remember here? I've looked in my book of remembrance, Malachi chapter 3, in the Lamb's book of life, Revelation 21, 22 to 27, and there's nothing favorable there about you. Or could the epitaph of the last verse of Nehemiah be on our tombstone, honestly? 
Nehemiah 13, 31, remember me, O my God, for good. Or when Jesus comes in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, 1 Corinthians 15, 52, it's going to be too late for us to get ready to make amends, to balance the spiritual budget and ledger, and to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant, if we've lived and died in sin and error and rebellion to his will, out of sorts with the Lord. In Job 7, 6, that ancient sufferer said, my life is swifter than a weaver's shuttle and is spent without hope. Two chapters later in 9.25 of Job, he said, my days flee away. He spoke earlier in Job 3.17 of a place where the wicked cease from troubling and where the weary be at rest. And then with the quaint sense of timing and humor in Job 14.1, he said, man that is born of woman is a few days in much trouble. In Job 24.22, he said, no man is sure of life. And friend, all of our appointments are subject to cancellation except one, and that's death. We'll meet that schedule. In Jeremiah 26, verse 11, evil men said of Jeremiah, the great prophet of God, you're worthy to die. But a godly Bible-knowing elder saved his life, and a prophet who had died 100 years earlier saved his life because the elder said, wait a minute before we kill him. Before he dies, do you remember Micah, one of our great heroes of all time, 100 years ago said the very same thing that Jeremiah is saying now, and we esteem him and honor him and want to kill Jeremiah for preaching the same thing Micah did. And those fickle people said, then he's not worthy to die. Turn the page to Jeremiah 27, 13, and he turns to these people and says, why will you die? Why will you die in rebellion to God's will when you could obey him? Honor his authority. Why will you die in infamy and rebellion? Out of sorts with God. Turn the page one more time to Jeremiah 28, 16. And he turns to a false but popular prophet. Are you listening carefully? And says, Hananiah, this year you shall die. And you can write one thing indelibly, that year he died. The last few verses of Daniel chapter 5, Belshazzar is told by God's statesman, God's prophet, God's servant, the God who made you, him you have not glorified. You've been weighed in the balance and found warning, and this night your life is taken from the earth. Abruptly, suddenly, without fanfare warning, this wicked man died where he lived in infamy, in rebellion to God. And 2 Peter 3.11 hauntingly says, This earth and the works therein shall be burned up, Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy living and godliness? That question of 2 Peter 3.11 rings in my ears. What manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy living and godliness? To Timothy, his young friend and son in the gospel, Paul said, I charge thee in the sight of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the living and the dead, the quick and the dead, at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word urgently. I have a good idea that a lot of people who think they don't like plain Bible preaching would beg for it if they knew they were about to die. I imagine a lot of people who forsake the assembly if they knew they were about to die might call on that preacher they don't like to hear preach the word and say, preacher, tell me everything from the Bible, give me every warning so I'll not go into this uncharted place unprepared. I know this. When I lived in a certain place and preached there for five years, there was a family that didn't like me at all because I preached so plainly. And they didn't come very often. When they had a tragedy in the family and death was at the door, they called on the person they didn't like to comfort them with God's word, which they didn't listen to. I found a family that had actually forgotten how to pray. They'd been out of duty so long. But death challenged them to think. I wish that type of thinking had lasted, but about the time they put the last piece of sod over the head of their loved one, they went back into apostasy and never came out of it. What if we had died last night? Where would that leave us spiritually? There'll be one resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust, Acts 24, 15. And when the Lord comes and all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and come forth, some to eternal life, some to eternal condemnation, John 5, 28 and 29. 
when he comes to be admired by all his saints, 2 Thessalonians 1, those who know not God and obey not the gospel will be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and the glory of his power. That same text, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. When he comes in the clouds and we meet him in the air, the righteous, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And we comfort one another with these words, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18. Revelation 6 says, The wicked will pray for the mountains to fall upon them, and the dens and the caves of earth to swallow them. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? Children of God are comforted with Psalm 23, 4, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Contrast that, though, with the true statement of Ecclesiastes 8.10. I saw the wicked buried. I preached a lot of funerals in my day. Some have been the saddest occasions of my life, some joyous. What a difference, what a contradistinction in seeing the lifeless form of a sinner lowered into the ground and presiding at a funeral for a devoted, faithful child of God who lived and died in Jesus. What kind of a funeral would your very own funeral be? In 2 Timothy 4, Paul said, I'm now ready to be offered. The time of my departure is at hand. I've fought a good fight. I've finished my course. I've kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give to me in that day, and not to me only but in all them also that have loved his appearing. Romans 6, 23 abruptly says, the wages of sin is death, eternal separation from God, forevermore out of the presence of the divine, in the realm of the ungodly and hellish, forever. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is life eternal through Jesus Christ our Lord. 2 Corinthians 5, verses 10 and 11 put the emphasis where it belongs. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the deeds done in the body according to that if done, whether it be good or bad, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord we persuade men. In Revelation 22, 12, our Lord spoke of the abruptness with which he will come whenever he comes. Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to render unto every man according as his work is. Isaac spoke for every one of us in Genesis 27, 2, when he said, I know not the day of my death. But he is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before his presence with exceeding joy. To the only wise God be glory and power, dominion and majesty, both now and forever. Amen. The two closing verses of the little one chapter epistle of Jude, verses 24 and 25. I like to think of the eloquence and challenge of an Old Testament passage and a New Testament counterpart that fit right here perfectly. Solomon wrote at the end of his days, a man who had had much power and prestige and wealth and declined rapidly, deteriorated certainly, but now inspired by the Holy Spirit as he closes his soliloquy, his final will and testament, he says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every work into judgment, every secret thing, whether it be good or bad. Revelation 20, 11 and following. John said, I saw a great white throne and him who sat upon it, from whose face the heavens and the earth fled away, so that there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and the dead were judged out of the things that were written in the book according to their deeds. And the sea gave up the dead that was in it. And death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. In the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die, God said to Adam and Eve. And when sin entered, they didn't die physically. They weren't removed from the world, but they were separated from God, though Adam lived for centuries after that. He didn't live well because sin was in the camp. Sin was in existence. And sin separates a man from God. So he did die in the spiritual Bible sense of that. He was separated because of sin, Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. And not until Jesus died at Calvary. And with one hand reached down and took man's hand, with the other held on the Father's hand, 
and brought the creature back to the Creator, the sinner back to the Savior, the unrighteous to the righteous, was reconciliation made possible. Men had been dead in trespasses and sins, Ephesians 2, 1, without hope, without God in the world, Ephesians 2, 11 and 12, but now they've been raised to sit with Christ in heavenly places, verse 6 of Ephesians 2, and they've been brought back, bound back to God, reconciled by the death of Jesus, who came and preached peace to them, verses 15 through 17 of that same second chapter of Ephesians. What a difference Jesus makes. What kind of a funeral would we honestly have if the Lord who always tells the truth preached it? What if we had died last night? Where would that leave our soul? In Psalm 89, 47, the writer said, remember how short my time is. I'm 59 years old. I used to think that was double ancient. I couldn't believe a fellow could even crawl, much less walk, when he got that old. When I was growing up, the average age span for a healthy person was 61. That was about 77. Uh, we used to be worth a dollar and fourteen cents. He used to tell us in chemistry. Now inflation makes that over five dollars and ninety cents. I want to tell you something. We're still not here very long. Psalm one forty four four says, "Man is like a breath; his days are but a passing shadow." Peter said, "Your life is like the grass of the field, and any glory that may accrue to it is like the flower of the grass. The grass with it, the flower fades away." First Peter one twenty four. James is more abrupt than that. He's really blunt. What is your life? It's even a vapor that appeared for a little while then vanished away. James 4.14. So if you think it's unrealistic to talk about our funeral while we're still in the land of the living, think of loved ones who have died suddenly. I learned yesterday about the relative of Brother Bob Watts and how they're going to be at a funeral this afternoon over in East Texas. People are dropping out like flies. There's always a page full of obituary notices in any city newspaper. So a preacher's not being overly psychological or sentimental or persuasive when he says what Hebrews 9.27 has been saying for centuries. It's a point that a man wants to die and after this come a judgment. I'll tell you what's sad. Revelation 3.1. The Lord said to a congregation that claimed to belong to him, the church at Sardis, you have a name that you live but you're dead. And 1 Timothy 5, 6 spoke of an evil woman in the first century. She is dead while she liveth. And an ice and Sapphira were in the land of the living. They thought they had it made and they'd even fooled God. They had kept back a certain amount of bounty they received and lied to the Holy Spirit. Peter said, why have you allowed Satan to fill your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? And before they knew it, they were struck dead, and before the evening sun went down, they were buried side by side, and they were members of the church. The first sin recorded in the early church was a sin of avarice, covetousness, and greed. And it's still a basic problem we face today. The Bible still cries, remember Lot's wife, Luke 17, 32. And we remember a woman who died in rebellion to God because she loved the pleasures of the world too much. When they pitched their tent toward Sodom, Genesis 13, she sent her soul toward hell. A preacher went home with a wealthy Oklahoma oil baron and cattle owner and landowner one Sunday. He had preached in this congregation in the major city area of Oklahoma. And while the wife was preparing the meal, the rich man took the preacher out on a tall plateau of his land and began to boast. He said, Preacher, you see all the oil wells out there in that direction? I own them. See all the land in that direction? I own it. See all the cattle over there in that direction? I own them. See the housing development back there? I own it. The preacher said, How much do you own in that direction? And that's the one that counts. 1 Timothy 6, godliness with contentment is great gain. We brought nothing into this world. It is certain we'll carry nothing out. Having food and raiment, let us be there with content. For they that would be rich fall into temptation and a snare, 
in the many foolish hurts and lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which some having coveted after have heard from the faith, pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things. Follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. Timothy put them in mind not to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. Did not Jesus say, What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Did he not say, Fear not him who is able to destroy the body and is not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both body and soul in hell? Matthew 10, 28. In 1 John 5, 16, brethren were told, not the world, but brethren. There is sin unto death. I do not say that you should pray for that. In the context of the Bible, the New Testament, and the book of 1 John itself, the only thing that sin unto death could possibly be is sin persisted in, continued in, lived and died in. That's sin unto death. Or any sin we will confess, repent of, God will forgive. The faithful Christian, 1 John 1, what if we had died last night? Felix and Agrippa ought to have asked themselves that question. They heard the gospel preach. One trembled, postponed obedience. The other admitted he was almost persuaded. But neither one of them, according to the Bible or history, ever stepped beyond the planning stages, the momentary influence and impact of a sermon. And as far as we know, like millions of others, they lived and died unprepared to meet God. The following is a true story. I'm not saying I recommend it, but it's a fact. Many years ago in West Texas, a man who had been a member of the church but was out of duty robbed a bank. As he went out the front door, he was shot and killed and fell on the pavement with the money in his hand right in front of the bank. That was one of the most notorious crimes in the early part of this century. They called on an old brother, well known for his preaching, to preach a funeral. Curiosity seekers by the hundreds came. The funeral chapel was packed. What would that preacher say? What could he say? A large family was gathered to mourn. They sang the songs, they read the scripture, they led the prayers. It came time for the preacher to say something. And I'll guarantee you, no one there ever forgot what he did. He walked up to the casket, put his hand right at the head of it, and said, the wages of sin is death. And that was it. What if we had died last night? Joseph said in the last chapter of Genesis, when I die, don't you bury me in this heathen land. You take my bones and lay them down in the promised land. I love the last two verses of the book of Joshua. Years and years and years later, when they got to the promised land, they honored his request. They had carried those bones all through the wilderness for years and years. And they put the bones of Joseph down in the promised land. Jesus said, lay not up for yourselves treasures upon the earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But rather lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth consume, and where thieves do not break through and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Don't leave me in this heathen, pagan, barren land. I want to dwell in the promised land of glory. Will we be there someday? Paul said, He shall preserve me into his heavenly kingdom. 2 Timothy 4, 18. Peter said, And so shall an abundant entrance be ministered unto you into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Paul said, I long to depart and be with Christ, which is far better, for our citizenship is in heaven. And Abraham looked for a better country, that is, in heavenly, Hebrews eleven sixteen. 16.
The psalmist beautifully, eloquently said, He will guide me with his counsel and afterwards receive me to glory. Psalm 73, 24. And exultingly, Paul said, Not even death can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 8, 38. But the soul that sinneth it shall surely die, Ezekiel 18, 20. Three verses later we read, God has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. But Psalm 116, verse 15 says, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. What a contrast, what a contradistinction. What if we had died last night? Now, let's get serious. I've said all that to say this. If we knew we would die today, if we received a telegram from heaven that said today is the day for you, what inevitable conclusions would we draw? If we knew we would die today, number one, we would certainly want to be a Christian. Those who have postponed obedience, those who have heard the gospel and have let it pour off them like water off a duck's back. If they knew today was the last day they'd spend, I'll guarantee you, they'd stand in line to be baptized into Christ. But the devil says, oh, you've got a lot more days. Go ahead and serve me. I'll let you know in just a nick of time and you can enter that 11th hour that Jesus talked about. What he doesn't remind them is that the world may end at 1030. But if you knew you'd live forever, why would you want to live in sin? But if you knew you'd die today, we wouldn't have to sing an invitation song. You'd stop the preacher like an Ethiopian did in Acts 8 and say, here's water, what the thing of me to be baptized. If I knew today would be my last day, I'd die before the evening sun Passed by, I would want to be a Christian. And I'd say with Saul of Tarsus, Lord, what will you have me to do? Acts 9, 6. And when told by a servant of the Lord to quit tarrying, arise and be baptized and wash away my sins, calling on the name of the Lord, Acts 22, 16, that's just what I'd do. It's what you'd do too. Number two, if I knew today was the end of the world, or that I would die today, I'd certainly want my loved ones to be saved. I'd make some phone calls. I'd write some letters. I'd take a journey, not to see the scenery, but to get to someone's house that was near and dear to me to convert them to Jesus so they wouldn't die in sin and go to hell. And I wouldn't put it off. And I wouldn't postpone it. What if we had died last night? How many folk that we should have talked to wouldn't have the opportunity to hear us share the gospel with them. What if they had died last night and nobody could get to them? Their doom is sealed forever. What if we knew today was the last day that we'd live? We'd want to correct all our mistakes. The following is a true story. I could tell you the preacher's name. Out in an area about 30 miles north of Abilene in 1951. One of the most heinous crimes ever committed took place. A man set fire to his wife's bed and his two children's bed while they were asleep. And as they fled from the house through the back door with their bodies already in flames, he stood at the back door and hit them in the head with a hammer. That's just a historical fact. If you'd get the Anson, Texas paper of 1951, you'd know I'm telling the truth. Some of you probably remember it. This man had a terrible, terrible temper. It came out that when he was a young man, he got mad at two horses in the field that didn't plow just right, and he took his ax and quartered them right there in the field. He went from horses to people. He lingered in the death row of the Huntsville State Penitentiary for some days, and when it came time for him to die, he called a gospel preacher friend of mine to spend the last 24 hours of his life with him. And this preacher said he'd never met a more penitent, sincerely penitent man, and he had proved it over several weeks period. And the last thing that man wanted the preacher to do, and don't ever forget this, he said, get down there to the telephone down the hall and call Mr. Brown, who lives where I grew up, 
and I sinned against him, and I did a grievous thing against him, and I never made it right. He said, I don't want to go to the judgment with that on my conscience. And he said, incessantly, he kept, over and over, he said, get him on the phone, whatever it takes, get him on the phone and tell him before I die, I'm sorry. And the last thing that man did is he walked down death row. He stopped at each cell and looked right in the eye of each of those men who would soon follow him down there to the electric chair. And he quoted Amos 4.12 to them. Prepare to meet thy God. Prepare to meet thy God. Prepare to meet thy God. He knew he was about to die, and he wanted to correct all his mistakes. If I knew today is the last day I would live, I wouldn't want any rift between me and any of my brethren. Because I've read Matthew 5 and Matthew 18. It says, if your brother has aught against you, or you have aught against your brother, you go to him. Ideally, if we all practice that, we'd meet halfway between your house and my house if we have a problem with one another. And if I knew I wouldn't live past today, I'm confident I'd be as urgent as that murderer was. I'd want to make things right. Matthew 5 says, agree with your adversary while you're in the way with it. The time is coming when you won't have opportunity to make it right. They put you in prison and lock that door and you've had it. That's Matthew 5. He said, if you come to worship, if you bring your gift to the altar, remember that you have wronged your brother or he's wronged you and you haven't made it right, get with him. What if we had died last night? Have we done everything we can do in harmony with those passages? And in the humility that each Christian is to express? It's a pretty serious matter. It's eternally serious. And last of all, if I knew I'd die today, in other words, if I hadn't died last night, and I had one more opportunity, and I knew I'd die today, and we all could, we don't know when we're going, we would want to be at peace with God and others, and with ourself. In Romans chapter 12, the last paragraph, Christians are told, as much as it depends upon you, be at peace with all men. That just threw that old song out the door, well, it's his fault. As much as it depends on you. See, we get real personal and sincere when it comes to death. And I stand individually before God. What brother so-and-so did or didn't do is not the question. It's kind of like, what about the thief on the cross? That old thief can't save people in the day of judgment. It'll be, what about me? Each one of us should give account of himself and to God. What if we had died last night? Pretty serious, isn't it? We're going to extend the Lord's invitation. It's his, not ours. There are those in this assembly that have heard enough gospel to save the whole world, but hadn't saved you yet. You need to come confessing the name of Christ, being buried with your Lord in baptism, raised to walk in a new life. If you're an erring child of God, you need to come back home and renew allegiance to your first love, Revelation 2, 4 and 5. Repent and pray God that perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven you, Acts 8, 22. And all of us who don't believe we need to come forward publicly. And incidentally, I'm not mainly interested in public responses. You'll never hear me over persuade or twist arms or sing a hundred invitation songs and turn the lights down low. I'll try to persuade you through the word. But let me tell you a secret. I'm after eternal responses in hearts and lives before God. Surely those of us in this assembly that have even good common sense, much less Bible sense, ought to thank God Almighty He's given us time and opportunity and use it to His glory and honor. Let us stand and sing. Selected. Selected. Screen